Hello, welcome to Cardio Flash College, a place to learn cardiology with flash animations. Today, we count with the collaboration of Dr. Maria Elena Tundidor Sanz, clinical cardiologist of the Hospital de Leon. Together, we will review an interesting topic, the athlete's heart. Join us! The term athlete's heart includes a set of cardiovascular modifications that athletes usually experience when they train intensely for a long time. Generally speaking, the athlete's heart presents three fundamental characteristics, which are functional changes, characterized by the increase of ventricular filling and the volume beaten, structural changes, represented by an increase of ventricular mass and of the size of the cardiac chambers, and electrical changes, frequently seen in the electrocardiogram, such as sinus bradycardia or alterations on repolarization. This said, let's take a closer look at each one of these alterations. Let's begin with the functional changes. As you know, the cardiac output of the high-performance athletes can go from 6 to 30 liters per minute during sport activities due to an increase of the volume beaten and the heart frequency, the increase of systolic volume is produced by three mechanisms, which are the increase of venous return, the frank starling law, and the decrease of peripheral resistances. On the other hand, the increase of heart frequency is produced by an increase of sympathetic tone and the action of the Bainbridge reflex. Functional changes of chronic characteristics are something different, because, in this case, everything will depend on the kind of sport performed. As you know, there are two types of sport activities, the isotonic exercises, also known as endurance sports, and the isometric exercises, or power sports. The first favor the decrease of peripheral resistances and the increase of venous return, which translates into a chronic volume overload that can produce dilation of the cardiac cavities and eccentric hypertrophy while the seconds, the isometric exercises, tend to produce an increase of the afterload, chronic pressure overload of the cardiac cavities and concentric cardiac hypertrophy. In any case, independently of the main component of the sport activity, intense training in the long term usually triggers an activation of the vagus nerve system, which clinically translates to a decrease of the heart frequency, longer diastole time, and an improvement in myocardial perfusion. Let's continue now with the structural changes. The structural adjustments of the heart are usually evident in the electrocardiogram, being more frequent in men than in women. This can be a symmetrical and discrete increase of the myocardial thickness without surpassing the upper limits of normal thickness because less than 2% of athletes have a myocardial septum greater than 30 millimeters of thickness and a light increase of volume of the cardiac cavities with left ventricular telediastolic diameters that usually do not surpass the 60 millimeters and without relevant alterations of the ejection fraction. It is here where we must be really careful because we cannot mistake the structural alterations produced by a cardiopathy with the structural alterations produced by an athlete's heart if so, the consequences can be regrettable, not only from a clinical perspective, but also from a sportive perspective, because misdiagnosis could produce disqualifications in athletes with disastrous consequences. In this way, we must know that there are four clinical scenarios that can be confused. These are left ventricular hypertrophy. This phenotype can be frequently seen in black race as symptomatic normotensive male athletes used to practice power sports. There are usually not electrocardiographic alterations nor background of familial cardiopathy or sudden death. The differential diagnosis can be established with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypertensive cardiomyopathy, anabolic steroid abuse, infiltrative cardiomyopathy, or aortic stenosis.
The dilation of the left ventricle can be another clinical form of the athlete's heart. This can be seen in people used to perform isotonic types of exercises. It uses to be asymptomatic without alterations in the electrocardiogram nor backgrounds of cardiopathy. The differential diagnosis can be established with dilated cardiomyopathy, chronic myocarditis, tachycardiomyopathy, nutritional deficiencies, or evolved valvulopathies. Another phenotype associated with the athlete's heart is the dilation of the right ventricle. This can occur in endurance athletes with an absence of symptoms, electrocardiographic alterations, or family backgrounds. The differential diagnosis includes arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, pulmonary hypertension, congenital cardiomyopathies, or the valvulopathies. Finally, the myocardial hypertroveculation has been mainly described in black race athletes submitted to isotonic exercises with the absence of symptoms, electrocardiographic alterations, or background of interest. As you can imagine, the main differential diagnosis is the non-compaction cardiomyopathy, although we should also consider a recent pregnancy, sickle cell anemia, or a valvular cardiopathy. Returning to the electric adjustments of the athlete's heart, generally speaking, we can say that there are three types of electrocardiographic findings. The most frequent ones are called common alterations. They are produced by the increase of the cardiac cavities, the increase of the myocardial thickness, and the activation of the vagus nerve system. They usually do not have clinical importance, neither usually require any specific study and they tend to disappear when the sport activity ceases. Some examples are the voltage increase in the QRS complexes without criteria for hypertrophy, incomplete right bundle branch block, early repolarization, juvenile pattern of repolarization, or the sinus bradycardia. Then we have the limit findings. They alone do not require any specific clinical study, but when two or more associate simultaneously, they can suggest the existence of an underlying cardiopathy. Some examples are the obvious deviation of the cardiac axis, the atrial growth, or the complete right bundle branch block. And, finally, we have those electrocardiographic alterations that always require a complete study by cardiology because they could correspond to physiological changes produced by the athlete's heart or to pathological changes generated by a hidden cardiopathy. Some of these alterations are negative T waves that do not correspond to early repolarization or with the juvenile pattern of repolarization, complete left bundle branch block or the existence of pathological Q waves, among others. <laughs> but what is the clinical relevance of the athlete's heart? It's simple. The athlete's heart can work as a distracting factor. In other words, the athlete's heart does not put health or the life of the patient at risk because it is not the cause of those feared sudden death episodes occurred in elite athletes during or immediately after training. No, these deaths used to be associated to the existence of a cardiopathy of bad prognosis that has not been identified in time or that it has been mistaken with the changes described in the athlete's heart. For these motives, different sport entities and scientific societies recommend the realization of a physical activity recognition in all high-performance athletes, especially those who compete, with the intention of distinguish functional, structural, and electric benign alterations of the athlete's heart from the pathological changes produced by those cardiopathies with risk of sudden death. The basic tools recommended by our European Society of Cardiology are anamnesis, physical examination, and a 12-lead electrocardiogram. Some authors even recommend performing a transthoracic echocardiography when knowledge and necessary resources are available. 
We found the explanation of the benefit of the screening in athletes in the study of Corrado's group. They studied 42,386 athletes from 1979 to 2004, with ages comprised between 12 and 35 years of age, and they compared them with a control group integrated by healthy people of the same age that were not athletes. Initially, incidence of sudden death was far superior in the athletes group. But this changed when measures of basic physical activity recognition previously described were applied, achieving a significant decrease in the incidence of sudden death in athletes regarding the control group. That's why the realization of an adequate screening is of vital importance, because it is all about correctly differentiating normal from pathological. This is important not only by the interest of decreasing the risk of sudden death, but also by the fact that a misdiagnosis of a cardiopathy can compromise irreparably and unjustifiably the athlete's professional career. Finally, we must say that there are some controversies related to this topic, such as who must assume the economic cost of the screening? Who must do it? Should an athlete that has lost its job unjustifiably by a false positive be compensated? And does the athlete have the right to assume the risk of sport practice, even knowing that it suffers from cardiopathy with risk of sudden death? We surely do not know. Those are questions difficult to answer, and probably there is no correct answer for all of them. In any case, we would love to know your opinion. What do you think about it? Submit your answers in the commentaries below. In this way, we say goodbye. It has been all for today in Cardio Flash College. We hope you liked the video. If so, subscribe to the channel and leave a like. We'll see you in the next class. And remember, don't come late. Bye.